Good evening. Welcome to the Candidates Forum for the primary election in Wyandotte County for 2014. All of the candidates who have opposition on the Wyandotte County ballot were invited to this forum. I'm Merle Bland with the Business West organization. Other sponsors include the Community College, the Kansas City, Kansas Chamber, Central Avenue Betterment Association, Leavenworth Road Association, Downtown Shareholders, Fairfax Industrial Association, the Kansas City Press Club, the Historic Northeast Midtown Association, and the Rosedale Development Association. And we, we appreciate all those organizations for being sponsors and helping promote this. Our first moderator will be Chuck Schlittler with the Downtown Shareholders, and he will ask questions of the Democrat candidates for U.S. Senate. Chuck? Thank you, Merrill. As the candidates make their way to their seats, we welcome Chad Taylor and Patrick Wiesner. And Mr. Wiesner, I understand that you won the coin toss, so you will uh, go first in, in Mr. your... Taylor won the toss. Mr. Taylor won, okay. I, we will let you do that then. First, some ground rules. Now that we got that little gaff out of the way, we can relax and, and have a good time this evening, gentlemen. You'll be presenting opening remarks, three minutes each. Our timekeeper is seated to your left on the front row, and she will indicate when certain uh, segments of time remain. We will then have uh, several questions that I will present to you, and then we'll have closing remarks, and you will have two minutes each for those closing remarks. And Mr. Taylor, you won the coin, uh, the coin toss, I understand, so if you'll begin with your opening remarks. Uh, first of all, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here uh, at your forum. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to get to uh, travel around the state and meet people from all four corners and, and have the opportunity to talk to them and let them know who I am and what I stand for. Um, my name is Chad Taylor. Uh, I'm a farm kid. I grew up on my folks' farm just north of Silver Lake, which is in the northwest corner of Shawnee County. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Kansas, went to law school in Chicago, came back, was in private practice for several years before uh, there were several people that asked me to consider running for district attorney in Shawnee County, which I did and have been in that role. I uh, ran unopposed in 2012 and uh, uh, was, was able to obviously be reelected, re and I'm in my sixth year uh, now as the district attorney. In that time, we've been able to accomplish a lot of great things. We uh, beat back a uh, case backlog of over 4,000 cases. Uh, that number today is about 120. To put that into perspective, our police departments will dump about 200 cases a week on us. Um, so those were four, over 4,000 cases where the crime victims had never had their day in court. The case had never been filed, declined, or sent back to law enforcement for follow-up. In addition to that, we have had uh, a, a cold case unit that I'm very proud of. Um, we've uh, brought uh, over 12 convictions. Um, for uh, enclosure for families whose uh, family members were, uh, were murdered and were able to finally get them their day in court and, and to deliver that justice for them. Having said all of that, the reason that I'm here is, is there's three votes I want to talk with you about. The first vote was Pat Roberts' vote against the Ag Bill. Um, the voting against the Ag Bill for a state where 25% of your domestic product comes from ag and ag-related products, not considering the secondary and tertiary markets um, that drive our economy. Uh, was was beyond me why, why someone would do that. The second was the vote against funding for vocational rehab and PTSD treatment for our men and women of the armed forces who have, who at, at our request have gone into harm's way uh, to potentially have to make the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms and our liberties. Uh, the last vote was the vote against the MBATH facility, uh, the biosciences facility in Manhattan, Kansas, as we sit here in, in Kansas City today. Uh, in the heart of the biosciences corridor. Um, those three votes sound to me more like a vote of a Vir Virginian than a Kansan. And I think it's very important that we talk about moving forward what we're going to do. And I will tell you I would have voted yes on all three of those votes because of their importance that they have for our overall economy. Because in traveling around the state, people are hurting. 
and we need jobs, and we need to start focusing on jobs for Americans and jobs for Kansans. So that will be my opening uh, comments, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Wiesner. Yeah, good evening. My name is Pat Wiesner, and I'm also a Democratic candidate for the U.S. Senate. Um, I'm a uh, Kansas attorney, an Army veteran, and a proud Democrat. Um, I grew up in Ellis, Kansas. I'm a one of eight children and uh, went to uh, school in, and graduated from Ellis High School and went to Colby College for two years. After that, I went to Fort Hayes and got a degree in accounting and uh, passed CPA exam, worked as a CPA for several years, and then uh, went to law school at KU and uh, got out of law school in 1992 and started a tax law practice in Johnson County and I've been doing that uh, ever since. Uh, I have uh, two children that I've raised. They both are college graduates. Uh, my, one, my son went to Wichita State, got a degree in computer science. He's working for, in the aircraft industry. I have a daughter that graduated from Clemson and she uh, is in the medical products industry <coughs> in Johnson County. Uh, I'm also a uh, Army reservist. I joined the Army Reserves uh, 20 years ago. I've had three post 9-11 deployments. I'm a contract and fiscal law attorney when deployed uh, for the U.S. Army. I uh, write legal opinions on the Army's request to spend appropriated money on different projects, and that was my function when I was deployed. As a tax attorney, um, I take in clients who usually I get them when it's too late. They are hopelessly insolvent and can't pay, so my job is to get them out of the, uh, the uh, problem they're in either by uh, offering compromise where they settle with the government or they come in with a payment plan or they go through a bankruptcy. A anyway, I want to use that uh, tax experience to better our system of collecting revenue for the country as a whole. Uh, we, uh, I would change that, a couple of things on that. I would uh, have us uh, not allow people to get so hopelessly insolvent that they can't take care of their family and can't pay their uh, tax obligations, that serves nobody any good. And I would uh, adequately staff the U.S. Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service so that they could uh, adequately do their revenue collection function. And uh, uh, contrary to what you hear in public discourse now, the IRS people that I work with are, uh, have a culture of integrity. They do a good job. They take their position seriously and they don't abuse uh, the public like you hear. And I would be glad to answer your questions tonight. And uh, uh, again, I'm, uh, thank, thank you for your time to address you this evening. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Wiesner, and this question will be to both of you, and I'll repeat it, uh, Mr. Taylor, if, if you need me to. There's is still a lot of confusion about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Mr. Wiesner, what would you do or what should be done to clarify issues surrounding this law? Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land now. We're, uh, I believe that uh, we can make it work. It costs about $95 billion a year. And if we've got that kind of commitment as a country, we can come up with a plan to make it work where we can be cost effective and get a healthy society out of it. There's about three changes I would make immediately. One is I would change the law that it would allow Medicare to negotiate uh, the prices for prescription drugs. Right now there's a statutory prohibition on doing that. Second thing I would do is to uh, and, uh, take steps to make sure everybody's covered. I, in my uh, tax and bankruptcy practice, I see too much where doctors and labs uh, put in their labor and resources and they've got unpaid bills and I don't want to see any professional who tries to help patients not get paid for it. And then the third thing I would do is we, we can, uh, since the country is, uh, has agreed to uh, finance 
health care. I think we could do a medical malpractice reform to where our doctors don't have to put out $150 billion a year in medical malpractice premiums. They can better use those resources to hire more nurses and equipment and see more patients. Mr. Taylor. How long do we have? For each question? A actually, I'll, I'll give you some guidelines as we go. So you, oh, okay. you, you are uh, welcome to answer the question. Okay, I just didn't want to go over time. Not a problem. If you, if you look at the Affordable Care Act, and, and, and I think that part of what we have to do is we have to, we have to educate the American citizen, citizenry on what is contained in it. Um, if you look at the talking heads and the drive-by media and the amount of disinformation that's being disseminated, as we've traveled around the state, we've had this conversation and people have been uh, angry. They've been frustrated. And a lot of that comes from the fact that they don't understand what is contained in the Affordable Care Act. The issues that they really like are the fact that if you have a pre-existing condition um, and you, you can't be denied coverage, um, there are no lifetime caps in the event that you have that, God forbid, uh, uh, medical crisis of bloodborne disease, cancer, heart attack, something of that nature. People also really like the fact that, that they can keep their children on their insurance until they're 26 years old so they can, they can finish their college and get on their way in life without having to go out in the aftermarket and find um, less, than, less than respectable insurance for their kids. The last component of it is, is that the Affordable Care Act, uh, as passed, uh, has actually allowed people who are in situations of being underemployed to be able to go out and leave jobs that they were anchored to only because of their health insurance, to be able to go out and actually take those jobs that they were doing on the side moonlighting um, to be able to then roll that out and, and create a full-time business out of that. And, and, and the freedom that's been provided statutorily on the marketplace is what has allowed that to happen. And I think that's a lot of the news coverage that we've seen nationally about the uptick in small business growth, which is so important because that's where so much of our job growth in our country comes from. Um, the, the, the confusion, I think, had a lot to do with the way it was passed, the way it was rolled out, and I think that what has to happen now is, and I do agree with my opponent, um, as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said, um, and Speaker Boehner said, and 58 recall votes later, it is still the law of the land. And so what I think we have to do is we have to get the right people around the table. Um, hospital administrators, physicians, physician practice group managers, the prescription drug companies, um, as well as uh, AARP and consumer uh, advocacy protection groups to be able to evolve this wide sweeping piece of public policy into uh, the potential that it has in order to keep our health care costs from ultimately bankrupting our country. Thank you. I'm going to ask our timekeeper, Bridget Cohen, if you'll uh, time these two uh, remaining responses at a minute 30 each, please. Certainly. I'm going to ask, in view of, uh, Mr. Taylor, I'll present this to you first. Yes, sir. You'll have a minute and 30 seconds to respond. In view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, problems in Afghanistan, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and we could go on and on. What does the United States need to do to improve our relations with other countries? I think that the first thing that we need to do is we need to be very thoughtful and very diligent on where we choose to send our, our, our men and women into harm's way at. I think that there has to be a clearly defined mission and objective as well as exit strategy when we make the determination of entering into military conflict. Um, in traveling around the state and talking with Kansans after the war in Iraq and the uh, war in Afghanistan, our people are exhausted of war. And I think that what we have to do is we have to find ourselves in a posture to where we mean what we say and when we say it, we'll do it. And in being inconsistent or wishy-washy on that and allowing um, our international partners to question where we stand and if our loyalty is really just that, loyalty um, causes erosion uh, in, the, in the world's confidence uh, as, as the United States is the leader and the superpower. So I think that we have to be make sure that the information that we're basing our information on, first of all, is accurate. And then when that decision is made, uh, that, it is, that it is utilized and carried out as precisely as possible 
with the exit strategy being clearly defined before we begin. Mr. Wiesner. Yeah, uh, we have uh, situations in Iraq and Afghanistan where we have taken over the country and occupied it and tried to westernize those countries and make democracies out of them. We have good objectives where they're not to be, we, we want those countries to be a, uh, a bastion of democracy in that area of the world and an ally of ours in, a, in the war against terror. What we didn't understand about either of those countries is that they do not normally elect their people uh, or choose their leaders by elections. They're usually done by acclamation or power or something like that, and they really don't believe uh, in their, they don't have a national sense of country like we do. They are more of a tribal area, and, and so for us to believe that we can westernize those countries and make a free market uh, uh, economy out of them was a mistake because they're not going to do that. In Afghanistan, we, they, we've set them up for a 400,000 man security force, and they have no way to pay for it. They have no tax system. That we are going to pay for their security force until at least 2023 now. They, they have no intention of, of taking it over. So we've got that sort of commitment. If we pull out of there, the whole government will collapse. So I think we made a mistake in our objective to begin with. We didn't understand their culture. So. Gentlemen, thank you. Because of our time restraints this evening, we'll move now to the closing remarks. And uh, Mr. Wiesner, you will close first. You will each have two minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I am uh, wanting this job as your U.S. Senator. As I said in my campaign uh, throughout, this, throughout uh, this last couple of months, I am the get the America out of debt candidate. I think we've got enough economic power and agricultural wealth and energy resources that we can pay for our generous government and have enough left over uh, to uh, pay off our national debt in 25 years. I know that's not a normal position that a Democrat takes, but I think it's attainable if we are disciplined and focused and are willing to work hard for that objective. I have, uh, I believe, unique expertise in the entire country on being a tax attorney and also a government fiscal law attorney. I can bring uh, uh, my experience working with taxpayers trying to interpret the tax laws and uh, to get us a simpler tax code and a more efficient collection system so that everybody will pay their fair shares so that we can use those, that money to fund our expenditures. I've got fiscal law and government law experience as an Army attorney. I was on the ground in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, working on projects, uh, uh, working on uh, having approval of uh, uh, using appropriated money on projects that my commanders wanted to spend on either the Iraqis or the Afghans. I can bring that ground level experience to the Senate and show them how money can be saved and, uh, uh, and actually have a more efficient contracting system to get our uh, mission accomplished. Uh, ask for your vote on August 5th. Uh, I wanna, I'd like to be your Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate. Thank you. Over the last six years of my life and the eight before that when I was an attorney in private practice, I came to the realization of what it is that we do every day. And it is our job to serve as the advocate for someone. So I'm going to ask for your vote, but I'm going to do it in just a little bit different way. I don't want to go to Washington to be your representative. I want to go to Washington to be your advocate, to advocate on your behalf, for your behalf, for your children, and for your grandchildren, because I believe that's important. I believe that America's best days are still in front of it, and I believe that Kansas is ours as well, but we have to utilize common sense in order to get there. We need to go back to the PAYGO budgeting rules. We don't need to go through extreme austerity. We just need to go back to what works. In 1998, or I'm sorry, in the year 2000, with $628 billion in the bank as a budget surplus, the baton was passed from one president to another. 
the PAYGO rules went out the window. And for those of you who don't know what they are, it's real simple. If you want to increase a dollar of spending over here, you have to publicly tell where that money's coming from. Are you either going to take it from this line item or this line item, or are you going to incur debt or raise taxes to do it? It's the best form of transparency that we can have. In addition to that, it will stop that printing press in the back row that so many people are concerned about is going to be the ruination of our country. I will tell you that focusing on Kansans and focusing on Americans first to get this economy off of dead center and get folks back to work so the next time I travel around the state, I'm not having conversations with people where they're telling me that they're gravely concerned and having conversations with their children and their grandchildren about leaving the state of Kansas in order to pursue economic opportunities because they're no longer here. That's not the Kansas I grew up in, and I believe that that's a real tragedy. I'd like to ask for your vote on August the 5th, and I would like to say one other thing, and that is that we've seen how ugly some of the primaries around the state have gotten, and I'd like to thank my opponent for running a clean and classy race. We've been all over the state together, and uh, I think that we've proven that it's okay to disagree without being disagreeable. So thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us.